I want to thank our sponsor today, Foxhound Fuel. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So they do a pre, during, and post-workout supplementation program. And it's it's really cool. Like they use real ingredients. I'm seeing turmeric, coconut, matcha, on top of electrolytes and vitamins, BCAs, glutamine. Like these are, when I think about glutamine and, and, and BCAs, the electrolytes, I'm thinking about martial arts, you know. But George, who who's, runs this company, when I spoke to him, he... I've discovered that he loves Iron Man's, uh, loves the martial arts, UFC, you name it. And he wanted something that had real products, like real things that's going to actually help him recover, prepare, all that stuff. And it made sense for me too, for jujitsu, you know, it's, it's a consistency thing. So it's a grind and we sweat a lot. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefit that we can have from using these products like this. So, um, I thought it would be a good fit. They're going to give us a discount code here. So it's from the Dojo 15. You'll get a discount and help us out as well. Um, come check it out. It's pretty cool. Round two with Andrew today. And uh, we're just, you know, Andrew always has good conversations. And like one of the things he asked me is, uh, hey, what do you think about this technique or this technique? So instead of being conceptual, which we will cover today, but like we can be more technical too, like more specific. And then hoping either the game is relevant for you or the, the advice about the game or the way I think about giving advice about the game or how I categorize or see uh, these things and whatever, start picking up on those more so the actual like specific specifics of the technique that Andrew is bringing up. If it's relevant to you, awesome. But I think it's beneficial to see, essentially this is a scenario, uh, lower belt asking uh, upper belt very specific game questions and then like my way of trying to help them out so hopefully it, other people can benefit and uh yeah let's get right into it so uh hit me andrew what what, what you got g all right 100 let's this go is what i got all right um so sing the um straight ankle locks how to incorporate straight ankle locks without it being a sacrifice of your position okay um and so because it seems like in a lot of games, it's there, right? So just pretty much how to incorporate straight ankle locks without being beat. Yes, okay. Uh, the number one thing right there is the fact that you know that this is like leg locks in general and then ankle locks in particular. Leg locks in general, but be, more people will be gravitated to straight ankle locks because it's legal earlier, right? So then it makes more sense. It's also like it, it's not it, – it can be – it, to be really efficient with the straight ankle lock, you, it ha, it, there is a lot of nuance and it can be technical, but uh, a lot of people see a straight ankle lock and be like, oh, I get it. I can, I can see how it works. And it's like, yeah, generally that's typically the case, especially if you're just a bigger dude and like you can just rip ankles off. So it's like um, it, it, it captures a wide, it casts a wide net for people to be interested in it, right? But the number one thing I say about straight ankle locks is um, uh, like you mentioned, there's an inf there's an inference here that it can be a detriment to your game. Okay, so before I give it in examples, I'll say I'll share what I think about straight ankle locks for new newer belts. This is what happens at lower levels: white, uh, blue, possibly into purple. Is that you? There's a concept of like you you work on something, you work on something, you work on something, and then you you. Uh, you experience techniques that work really well, and then you experience techniques that just don't work that well uh, right off the bat, right? So what lower belts tend to do is if it doesn't work with an X amount of investment of time and brain, like bandwidth, is th this is just not going to work for me and I got to move on to something else. So there's this thing of like you pick up a tool and like it works, great. You hold on to it. You pick up a tool, it doesn't work, hey, it must be bad, and then you move on. You know what I mean? But – the reality is the the uh, uh, like a a more experienced person would see the tool and be like, I can see how this applies here, 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 and as a result, it's going to be beneficial for me to take this on, right? Uh, this goes in contrast to what I said before, which is find out things that feel good, like things that excite you, things that motivate you, things that like get you wanting to work on it. You're more likely to do that. So th these things can compete, but they're both really good ways to approach technique. You know what I mean? Me personally, like. Yes, I arguably burn blows are really effective for for various scenarios, and it would be smart to see things as an objective way and be like, "This is a this is proven technique that works. I should go approach it." But there's another side of me, be like, "Well, I have a I have a prior back injuries, neck injuries. I'm 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 
uh, I'm dancing with the devil if I go with this. So in the long run, it won't work out for me. Like I can make these decisions at the lower belt level. It's more, they don't see the, they don't see the potential of techniques. It's harder to see, right? It's, it's literally impossible. Like you've it, it, relative to how long you've been training to the ability to discern if a technique is, has legs for you is really difficult. You know what I mean? So one of the things that lower belt people like to do is they look at the straight ankle lock as like, man, I could capture it from so many different angles and I could start finishing people. And it's really effective. The only problem is that sometimes it can be so effective initially that uh, people will give up bad positions or they will avoid working through positions that they need to work through. For instance, if it so Andrew, you're like standing and the dude's on their back right and then they're like you're walking into their guard you're getting ready to pass it and there's this open guard scenario there's two things that happen at the lower belt it's like i need to work on getting better at this open guard shit but then other people get frustrated hit walls they hit plateaus and like the reality is you need to fight through those plateaus to like get to this next level of like how to approach problems and how to approach other people's games and what you need to do to your game to get through that. That does require sometimes like, uh, st like stagnancy in your game. You know what I mean? I, 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 everyone goes through it. So it's like, it's, it's not that it's necessary. It's that it's expected, you know, but instead of stagnancy, people just like are fed up with stagnancy. They're fed up with hitting the wall. And instead of f working on passing the guard, they will immediately start looking for ankle locks. You see, do you, do you can like what I'm trying to set up is a scenario where you hopefully you can see that uh, there are things where there's this phenomenon where people move on to next things versus sticking it out. And then as a result, they hurt their core game or their fundamental game and then are constantly doing not technique and concept. They're doing tricks. OK, yeah. so the number one way to not be beat when you're doing these uh, ankle lock scenarios, this particular scenario you brought up is ask yourself, as long as I don't sacrifice position, then I can feel, feel good about pursuing these X submissions. You know what I mean? The difference between, just a simple breakdown for me is the difference between Samba, which has a lot of leg locks, and Jiu Jitsu is emphasis on position dominance, right? So in Samba, they'll do a lot of sacrifice throws and they'll dive for leg locks and then they'll go from one sub to the next, but uh, you know, given the rule set where they reset you quite often, like you can get away with that. But in jiu-jitsu where if you go, for, there are much deeper consequences to losing position to gain a sub and then lo losing the sub and you're left with being in a bad spot. There's way more consequences in jiu-jitsu for that. Uh, you could argue which one's more realistic. You know, I personally think jiu-jitsu is more realistic. You know what I mean? Um, the rule set is more in line with realism to me. So my thing is, remember, what makes jiu-jitsu insanely powerful is number one the lack of rules relative to other sports and number two emphasis on position okay so going back to your question now i can answer it in a very specific way which is the number one way to start doing ankle locks and not be beat is applying ankle locks uh in an appropriate environment versus as a substitute for passing the guard or whatever like that. You know what I'm saying? So right. like in, in that Delahiva guard situation, I would urge you to focus in on how do you defeat the uh, Delahiva do various means that doesn't require giving up position. You know what I mean? So let's say you were playing, you were playing Delahiva and you're the guy on bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Setups to the leg lock there is awesome because if it fails, you come up on a sweep or whatever. You know what I mean? But if you're in a dominant position or you're, you're in a position where the ref is expecting you to progress and you sit down to get the ankle lock and the dude stands up, that's a sweep. Like they will, they will get, they will, that would be a good thing for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yo. Yeah. Um, bro, so, so what about, so you say you're a, like single leg position or whatever, you, you sweep the guy down and then you have that straight ankle lock there. Um, is there a downside that if you go for that straight, like, because from there you're at a dog fight for who controls the pants, right? Yeah. Like whoever controls the pants is going to come up. Um, is there any detriment to going for the ankle lock? If you can control, if you can maintain pant control while you're doing the ankle lock. And then after that coming up. So, 
single leg axe or, or some sort of guard where, where you sweep and the ankle ankle locks right there. You okay, so you're on bottom, you swept the and okay, got it. Um now is there any downside to to can so from here my my mind is thinking control the pant and whoever controls the pant the strongest is coming up from the sweep right like from here it's like a scramble for pant control yeah but it's like think about the 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 the, the context of the situation like in this situation like let's say you were in x guard or whatever you swept the guy on top and both of you guys are on your side you know what i mean both of you guys are on the floor right right uh, if you come up, you get points. If the other dude comes up, there's just zero points. So it's not like it's it's not that neutral. Like whoever comes up first gets points there. It's like he was already up. So like the 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 context is if you come up, you're that's considered a sweep. If you don't come up, it's considered just a recovery, which is nothing. You know what I mean? Right. Well, there's the opportunity cost of the points. There so, are so that's for my you. question. Yeah, there so are. So is you. there is so do you do you see downside? Do you think going for the ankle lock there? makes it less likely that you'll be able to come up and get those two points? Or is it the situation where you go for the ankle lock and you maintain control of the foot and then you still have equal likelihood of being able to come up for the two points? Yeah, like, uh, for instance, like, uh, here's a second piece that most people don't know. I didn't know it for the longest time. Like, uh, the intricacies of, okay, so here's the thing. When you're sparring and coming up with these very specific scenarios, it has to be in the context of IBJJF. Right, because uh, based on the rule set, will dictate whether you're doing something good or bad, right? Like, or whether you're playing with fire or you're not. So, uh, in this situation, I just states that if you're in the middle, it doesn't matter if you swept or came up on, you prevented a sweep or you, they're taking your back, got hooks in. If the second a, a submission is deemed like realistic, the the point, the points or the points that happen during this like this this scramble or whatever essentially gets like held in a like in their head like it's like okay so you you let's say you swept him from bottom you have the ankle yeah. lock in your thing that's boom it's submission attempt and you stood up like you're on your feet like in the dudes on their back and you still have their ankle and you're going for the ankle lock that would consider a two-point sweep but it's in the middle of a sub so the points are frozen until the the the, the submission attempt is deemed like gone then they'll start to count or whatever, or just I, I, that part. I'm not too specific, but they will give you points if you're still on your feet and you let go of the ankle. You, you see what I'm saying? Can you can you stand up from that ankle lock position from from straight ankle lock? Absolutely, you can. Yeah, you can do that. You know what I mean? Like, um, is it the most like effective way to finish? No, but like this goes into uh, risk mitigation as far as in a competition setting and thus a sparring setting in in the gym. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it makes no sense to, like, it's not that I want people to start recording points in their head. It's it's more about doing, like, snapshots of your position and being like, what is the what is something my coach would tell me to do right now, given the, the scenario, the context, and the rule set, yeah? And so you can sort of create a framework to coach yourself when you're sparring, which is necessary a lot of the times because coach is busy coaching too many people, you know what I mean? So, like, in this scenario where, uh, let me... Let me swing it around, right? Uh, let's say you just got swept, right? You know that the once a submission attempt is engaged, uh, points are frozen, okay? So, like, let's say you're the top guy. There's a guy underneath you. He had you in their X guard. You, they sweep you, and you're both on your ass, right? First, per, uh, if he comes up before you do, he's going to get points, okay? So, right. what... So you're thinking, man, I need to stand up to just let's go back to where we were. But you know for sure he's going to beat you to the punch. And he's going to get up before you can, right? So what is your options? You either concede the position and you just move on and try to sweep him. Or you can wrap your arm around their ankle and then start going for a, a leg lock right then and there. The ref will um, – he wants to give the other guy two points, but it's frozen because in the, it's, there's a submission action going on. If you use that ankle lock to sweep him, so you effectively, that three seconds that they need to maintain to get the points, you've essentially frozen that, giving you more time to sweep the guy to recover. And then, like, you you took advantage of the submission rule set to be able to prevent giving up those two points to get swept in the first place. Right. But, but there's no – I was going to say there's no benefit to doing that as opposed to just getting yourself in a good sweeping position. But the benefit would be that you might submit him. And you might win. 
Yeah, I mean, anytime you you in a position, sometimes you put your you do a submission and you know you're not going to get it right. How often has that right. happened, right? But a lot of times you can engage that on purpose to avoid scenarios where you might be giving up points, you know. And so this goes back into like you can coach yourself. This is this is very important, like little nuance. Like I when I sparred for many many years, I never even thought about that shit. You know what I mean? But like habits are built from sparring, so like um, you can use this to your advantage. Now, um, number one, as you compete or as you start to compete, really, really um, focus on, especially the first tournament, dude. You're so you're gonna be so focused on is my gi regulation? Where's the bullpen? Like, when do you call my name? Is that my competitor right now? Fuck, should I talk to him? Should I not? Like, uh, why did that guy get DQ'd? That's so weird. What what am I missing? You know, there's gonna be so many things. That's, that's, you have to like level up on before you can even focus on, all right, I'm gonna hit this game. I'm going to fuck, you know, you, you're going to think about it, but it's, it's, there's so much other things like preoccupying you up, up until that point, you know? So, um, it's really important for you to like understand the rule sets. One of the things I would do is I would, mm-hmm. I would watch jujitsu matches and like, like, don't even listen, just look at this, like score it myself. And at the very end, like, does it match? Did I get it right? Did I get the advantages right? Did I get, so this is a good way. This is a good practice to analyze Mm. footage for your own benefit, but also to like learn the rule set a little bit better. You know what I mean? Um, Mm. uh, So there's that, but uh, your question, remember the official question was like, how can I do uh, ankle lock without blowing it? And I think the number one thing, the concept is anytime where you're not giving up good positioning, now there's a caveat to that. If you if the dude has his ankle on, out and you know if you just touch it you're gonna get the win, I don't care what position you're. You should fucking die for that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's the main thing. So let's think about it. So your scenario of like I'm on bottom X, I swept the guy, we're both a, a ass on the ground. You have a couple options. You can go straight for the ankle lock, right? Don't even bother standing up. Like if you stand up, arguably is not as effective as staying on the floor to finish. Your finish rate goes down when you stand up. So you have to make, you got to juggle the, the outcome on one end. It lowers your chance to finish, but you, you run the risk of uh, getting points and finishing in a top position, or you can really commit to the sub, but if you lose the sub, you might lose position. Uh, it's not, it's not as easy as like one or a or B it's based on like your confidence level. Like I'm confident I can finish this. We'll go to B or I'm not confident that I can be able to finish this. And I know I'm going to end up in a bad space. Go to a, right? So you, you got to play these like A-B scenarios a lot to be good at making those decisions right then and there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's this one guy I used to train with and he's like the best guy I've ever trained with, the best guy. And he and I met him at Purple and he's a brown now. Uh, and he was he he was so focused on doing like being having dangerous jujitsu that he lost a lot of ma- – not a lot, but he lost a number of matches just because he came up at the wrong time. Like obviously like – you're the sweep scenario and you come up like that's good because you're being aggressive and you're maintaining good position. But in that scenario, it led to like walking into a DQ or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So just having dangerous jujitsu isn't enough to do well in tournaments. Right. So like mm. on the mat every day, he was a monster, but in tournaments, like there were just some technicalities that got f- prevented him from winning major tournaments. And he was like, he was ready to do that. And so um, when you talk about competition and being competitive, this is your obligation, but at the same time, by being better at this, you can really run the rule stuff. It just takes a few tournaments to like get comfortable, but eventually you're going to be up and running. And then that's when your game really explodes. That's kind of funny, isn't it? That like you have like ring IQ and like basketball IQ, football IQ. It's such a big part of, of playing those sports. Mm-hmm. But, but if you, like you were saying, if, if, or I guess like you were saying before we started talking about the, uh, the hobbyists that don't compete, they um, like you're not building that tournament IQ, right? Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> which so, would, which is like what you're saying is like a fundamental part of the sport, right? Like, like it is with any sport, like you know yeah. what I mean? Like it, in basketball, the, when they throw it off the guy's back in bounds, and then, you know what I mean? That's a difficult part. Here's the thing: that's a difficult part, and, and so. Um, I don't know if you, we, we can, we want, do you want to turn this into like a, do you want to go over the competition stuff? Like what I think, like why competitions are good for people or whatever, or you want to stick to the game stuff? Cause I, I'm cool. Like, uh, I'm more curious in the game stuff. Okay. Let's do that then. Okay. But just to answer that, mention that stuff, 
just a quick i want i can go for hours on this i actually went on a rant this week with one of my guys peter and i was just like yo i can go for days fuck you know what i mean but it, it's simple Compet- here's the thing in my opinion and it's important the nuance of why but just simple as this if you compete you're you're more dangerous simple as that and it's not because of the it's not because you're better at you know that mat iq that you mentioned it's not that's not the reason why you're you're more dangerous that's more of like uh something that gets you past the hurdle of learning to compete so like when you compete it's not about the best guy in the gym will win the tournaments it's not that at all there's a there's a whole skill set to compete to even be competitive yeah i've seen and i've seen this in wrestling and i've seen this in other sports is like the guy who's not that good on the mat arguably was doing winning at a higher rate than the other guys you know what i mean and then we know those studs on the mat and then they go to tournament and they might not perform at all you could talk about luck but like that the the purpose of being a competitor in my opinion to be competitive you have to join these tournaments to learn how to win before you win so that takes a while um but the purpose of being a competitor is that you've learned enough about the game and the rule set to minimize luck making a big factor of winning or losing the se- second that that like question mark thing happens less and less and you're just everything's linear now you're in a position where you can wa- go beyond that you know we're talking about competition strategy mad iq that's important that's good and it translates even to sparring which will benefit you uh as well but the major thing is putting yourself in a position to go 100% and fighting through it because how many times have we like we we know that we're looking at the clock and we're just like fuck two minutes left it's just i'll let them just chill you know i'll, I'll go chill and let them do their thing fuck i just want to make it to the end of the round but when you're in a tournament situation you do that that's called breaking you know what i mean in sparring that's not called breaking that's just cruising till you get to the next round and then you can have a recovery round and then you can go hard on the next round that's just like in the, in a training environment that's that's called pacing that's called being strategic and with your man, uh, energy management but in a tournament you can't do any of that you have to go as hard as you need to to win that doesn't mean if you if, if you need to go if you know you can exert x amount of effort and you're going to get the win there's no reason to go higher than that cuz you have more matches you know what i mean right. right but uh um uh yeah competing puts you like once you get past the hurdle of learning how to compete and now you're actually competing to win or competing to really play your game. That right there is this uh, like this holy, this holy land that you've landed on that now you're on faster route to enlightenment. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that's what I mean. Like competition is good because you eventually reach this point and then you start to really like accelerate because, yeah, I could talk about, oh, you, you, uh, you can – the reasons why you lost, you can go back to the gym and work in that, or uh, you know the rule set better, so you make smarter decisions on the mat. That helps you out as well. There's, uh, uh, you prepared for the tournament, so your cardio is just on another level than three, four months ago. You know there there are all these accumulated things that help you, but to me, the major thing is that that really accelerating, becoming a jujitsu competitor. That process, once you get past that, then you're at this like uncapped, like thing that just levels you up because you're. You're able to make these high level choices live against a hundred percent resisting opponent. And you have no, you have every obligation to not give up on yourself and you have to go. Right, right. So there's mental progression. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, testing your game and seeing where it starts to piddle out. And then there's other parts where it's like mm. this game, this part of my game was strong the whole time. So, okay, this is good. And then, you know, shit like that. So this is what right, I mean. Right. And that was me make going through that quickly, but like, yeah, that's why I think competitions are good. And in my opinion, is I use the word hacking, hacking jujitsu, hacking your jujitsu progress is to compete. Uh, there's and, a, and there's the hurt. You just got to get through the hurdle. You just got to learn it, yeah. put it in, and then you're unlocking this tool that's like going to help you. Yeah, like if you if you competed three tournaments in a row, would you just call yourself a competitor? I think most people wouldn't do that. They'd be like, yeah, dude, I've Dude, three tournaments, I lost nine matches, bro. Like, I, I won zero. Do I consider myself a competitor? No, not really. That's what p- most people will go through, right? So, yeah, give your chance, give yourself a chance. Understand what you're getting into and understand that it takes time to learn to be competitive before you can actually be competitive. So um, you need a number of uh, tournaments under your belt to even before you could even consider – you would even want to consider yourself a competitor. You know what I mean? So there's right, that. Right. So that's that's a huge part and then um but then there's other things like um 
there's a difference between winning and losing. And that's something we I mentioned to you. Like, I can give a fuck less if you win or lose. Many coaches be like, are you going to win? No, nah, why are you competing? You know, there's that. But then me, like, or the assumption, you competing? Well, I'm assuming you as a student want to win, right? You want to, and then, but the reality is, some people do, and that's great, and that you still get all the benefits plus. But um, I also feel like the people that think that you the you have the assumption that you have to win is why you compete, like why you sign up is because you expect to win or you want to win. I don't care if you're the worst guy in the gym; you're competing because you want to win. I think that mentality most people don't have, or accept, or uh, feel comfortable with. So, what does that mean? They just don't compete. And that's the problem. This is what I say. One minute of jujitsu training is better than zero minutes. Does it like uh, philosophically, right? So one tournament is better than no tournament. Even if you hate, you hate the competitiveness, you hate the anxiety, you hate all that compete. But uh, uh, if it means to not give a fuck about winning or losing equals more people, more people seriously considering signing up for competing then yeah i think it would be it's a much healthier perspective to have to be like man fuck when you're losing dude i don't give a fuck i'm putting myself out there and i'm just gonna see how i am like uh that's what it is i'm a staunch self-defense guy i don't care about brim blows i don't care about all that but it's like yeah but you will never feel the adrenaline dump of a self real self-defense scenario uh other than when you compete i remember you saying that before that that the, the self-defense in jujitsu is competition or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, that's I agree. I think the closest thing to real-life self-defense isn't to go to your gym and put gloves on or MMA gloves even and just like, okay, Quite. I'm going to fucking – we're just going to – one guy's the bully, one guy's going to defend, and then like one guy's on bottom and top dudes just start wailing down with punches. It's like that – I get I get why they would do that, but honestly – uh. IBJF sport competition. Uh, there are things that you pick up competing in that environment uh, that is way more relevant to their growth as as a self defense minded person. You know what I mean? Yo, and the points haven't really changed since. Like, didn't Helio make up the IBJJF system? No. Or no. or one of the old school guys? Oh I no, no, it's a uh, Carlos Gracie, I believe. He's he's like a he a millionaire, bro. Like he's a he's an OG guy, but he like he pretty much like. Um, created uh, what we know as IBJJF. You know what I mean? That, is that that's Helio's brother or a son? I don't know the actual details. I think it's his that, brother, right? I think something Carlos like is that, Helio's maybe uh, something like that. I'm not sure, but yeah. he's very much like a businessman. That's what he's known as, uh-huh. and like he he did all that. Like Hicks and Gracie start started his own federation. Like there's so oh, many bro. so many people start their own federations and stuff like that. So are the I, points different in Hicks's? It, they are there because it's philosophy. Oh. So like the point, the rule set is dictated by the philosophy of the people running the organization, right? This is why the, there is no difference between judo, jiu-jitsu, taekwondo, sambo, except the rule set, rule set, which right. dictates the rules of how we train, which dictates what we can and can't do. So right, in my right. opinion, martial arts are different because of the rule set that they instill on themselves. Like in taekwondo, you're not allowed to punch someone in the face. So they oh, kick really? people in the face. Right. That makes sense. Right. But then in boxing, you're not allowed to kick anyone in the face, but you can punch him in the face. So like if you if I look at the rule set first and then decide what like the, the ramifications of the martial art. So when I look right, at right. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the, I personally believe the reason why Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is so effective is because when they first started, there wasn't really a rule set. Like the rules were you can't punch. You know what I mean? You can't slam. And like that was roughly it, you know. And so. Um, yeah, so competition. I'm glad you're considering competing. I encourage more people to compete. I should do a separate competition episode, but um, let's get let's jump back into your like questions about the game. Did I answer your okay. question about the single uh, the ankle lock thing? Yeah, that um, I mean that it that it's a yeah. So you get so you get to the position where you have the possibility for the ankle lock, and you consider okay, I'm going to go for the ankle lock. What are the possible outcomes? Or I finish the sweep. What are the possible outcomes? So well, no, so going to the conceptual. So like, um, I want you to apply single. I want you to consider applying this technique whenever it's the most beneficial to you, right? So like, don't do it when you're in an open guard. You're the guy on top, and then you're falling back on an ankle lock. That's just like, that's not. It's 
is it effective? Of course it is. But is it is it what I would recommend a person learning jujitsu is starting to learn jujitsu? No, I would be like, yo, let's focus on the past. Let's focus on the past. The past has way much has longer legs than uh, an open guard suicide attempt at a at an ankle lock. You know what I mean? Like, if you look at the best ankle lockers in the game today, is Mikey Musumeci, and what he does is he pulls guard. The other guy pulls guard, so it's a double guard pull. And in this scenario, whoever comes up first gets uh, uh, gets the su- gets the uh, takedown points or the sweet points. But M- M- Mikey, he pulls to take her back. But in the process, he'll he'll sneak in an ankle lock if he sees an opportunity. You know what I mean? And the way he does it is he he does it like a like a WWE shit where like he steps over and like he arcs his back. You know, like that that's premeditated because if he loses that, he's on top position. You know what I mean? So oh. he worked out a way. This is why he's world champ. He, the rule set taught him the flow, the guidelines of where he should go. But he also modified the technique to where he can have best of both worlds. Where he His maxim- back's not exposed if he loses that? No, because if he loses that, he's the one on top. All he has to do is pivot towards the guy. Whereas the other dude, his belly's down too because then his ankle's being like fucking cranked, you know? Oh, that's very clean. Yeah, it's very clean. So, like, that, that's would you say that's ingenious? I would. Like, it's. I, w- I would say that's ingenious. Yeah. Why aren't I, more people doing that? A lot of people are doing. I mean, like, he's such a he's such an influence that more people are doing it. It's just that like he's the best at it. He's right? an influencer. Yeah. the The reality is, like, in jiu jitsu, there's trends. So, like, um, he'll. Yo, he's so clean, dude. The way he walks around the mat, he's so clean. He's clean. He seems so smart. You know what I mean? And so, uh, yeah, yeah. He seems like he's he's the consummate like jiu-jitsu addict you know what i mean like he seems and so it's not about being addicted to jitsu it's about thinking about ways to become cutting edge and he worked out a way you know what i mean um so it, you know when i say modern game that's who i think about you know so um mm. that's a perfect so that's an example of going for straight ankle lock but if you if you did a double guard pull and then you're now coming up it doesn't make sense for you to drop down and then go for it because you should have done it when you're on the bottom now that you've committed it going up to your feet Let's secure the pass, the secure really good position, or set up a back take, and then now you're in a really dominant position. Now you can have better opportunities for submissions. Right, and if you maintain the ankle lock grip, they can't come up, right? Or well, let me what do you have to do way. to prevent them from coming up? Tight knees. Yeah, I mean, like uh, leg entanglement's important. Like just body positioning. Um, you can grab the other do the other ankle to prevent them from like getting a base to come up. You know, shit like that. Like I got. I got in that today, bro. I went, mm. the guy got me in a straight ankle and I hopped over the leg and then yeah. he hooked my other ankle and <laughs> ankle locks me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's legit. He's that guy's problem solving. You know what I mean? Um, the, the, for me, when I get anyone starts to wrap their arm around my ankle, I just put weight on it. So I just try to stand up ASAP. Even if my, his, he's wearing like a 50, 50 position, like I'll stand up and then, just to give me some breathing room, and then I'll, to, given the scenario I'm in, I'll decide how to like dismantle it from there. What if? Um, so, what about the situation where, like, he say he got like a single leg X sweep or something, and that inside knee is really strong against like your crotch? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you? How do you stand up from there? Oh, I mean, like, think about this: the single leg X position when you were standing, and the single leg X position the second you 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 lose your balance and start going down. And even the when you land your ass on the floor, the single leg position didn't change at all. So if you know that, that means that you have an incentive to be really quick about coming back up to your feet. There's nothing stopping you essentially. You hear me? Now, if right. they opened up, they swept your single leg X and they opened up the inside knee to the other side and started hooking your other leg, preventing you from being able to get a base to come up. Yeah, now you're really fighting. But then like the 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 chance of the the ankle lock lightening up is higher so is there this is you know that's jujitsu right but when i get swept off single leg x in from a and they're going for ankle lock i'd stand back up there's no real limitations to standing up in that scenario Hmm. unless they modify the guard they put you in you know so um yeah ankle lock yeah go ahead i like that man i like i mean it's like so, so that was that was kind of like the point of the question is it was like, is this a submission? Is this like a freebie submission attempt? You know, it's from you get the sweep or you double guard pool, you, the opportunity for the submission. 
is it is it possible that it can be played so that there's no downsides to going for it, right? Absolutely. And it seems and like kind of, there it is, right? One million percent. Like uh, there's Clean. there. So this is this is there is a concept that I like to think about, which is freebie subs. And it's not just ankle lock; it's anything. There, it just depends. It's just a scenario. It's not the sub. You know what I mean? No, 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 there's very few subs that are just like always freebies. You know what I mean? But it's really the context of the scenario. So, for instance, my version of freebie subs. What is my definition of freebie subs? It's you can go for this attempt, and if it fails, you lose nothing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like money on the table. Like, why wouldn't you go get it? So, for instance, a perfect example, my favorite place to do freebie subs is I lock up the triangle. And then while most people are worried about, like, getting the arm across the face and, like, setting up the, the, the hip position and maybe adjusting your hips so your legs can lock even deeper and you're pulling on the head, you know, I can go through that whole scenario or I can just – I got you in a pretty tight triangle, not perfect. I'm just going to go for a straight arm bar from here. And if the if the arm if I can't finish the arm I go right into the triangle choke so it's like there was a density of attacks within instead of start to finish going for that one attack I'm throwing in other subs so like it's like if it finishes sooner that's great if it does if it fails to finish uh, then I I have this ultimate goal of fully locking in the triangle right so that's a perfect example of freebie freebie sub so in a, in an ankle lock position. It, the freebie is more like I could either finish them or I can come up on the sweep. That's more in line with the scenario I'm talking about. You know what I mean? I, 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 uh, I'm down with that. I'm going to start yeah. working on it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I, yeah, like, uh, whenever I triangle someone, I go for the wrist lock. So that's like, to me, a freebie sub, like I don't lose position. I'm not giving up position. I'm not, I don't have to move them in a particular way. The arm is right in front of me anyways. So I can go, I throw in the triangle, I lock it in. I go wrist lock fails, arm lock fails, triangle. So like, I have like a three piece, three piece in a soda right there for like, whenever hey. I'm in the triangle position, you know what I'm saying? Speaking of that, dude, I got, I got some Sierra mist. I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Clean. Yeah. Yo, so so this is, and that seems like something that would be applicable for a lot of people, right? Because oh yeah, that's a common, that's a very common game. Uh, what the tri the triangle or the ankle lock? The uh, they're the both common. They're both common. Guard. Yeah. I would say the guard that puts you in the posi in a good position to have an ankle to have a straight ankle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about After it. Like. How, so the the like for instance the Mikey Musumeci style of like double guard pull to ankle lock, you don't even have to double guard pull. Like how often are we in a scenario where we're, like we're both on our butt on the mat, right? Like um, that's like that's like right after a sweep and both of you guys are on the floor. You know what I mean? Like that's everywhere. So yes, uh, how often can we touch the ankle? All the time. So I get why people are attracted to the ankle lock. The only thing is it's so widely available. People have a hard time determining going for the sub is actually good for them in the long run or not. You know, like I got a guy, I got one of the students and I'm trying to break him out of it. But again, like people are autonomous people and they want to do the thing. He's really bad at sweeping, but he'll pull guard, right? But he pull guard to do leg locks. But then what ends up happening is he will get the sweep because the leg lock failed and then he'll come up versus setting up a sweep, right? The only issue is like, well, that sounds great. It's like, well, he's not doing that on purpose. It's just his leg lock game isn't the most effective yet. So then he ends up having to bail on it. And then he ends up recovering in a positive position. That's great. And I don't really need to mess with that because he's discovering that. He's like, I'm going to give him an opportunity to discover that as like a, a formal strategy versus this is just what happens all the time. I, don't, I can't, I can't pin, put a pin on it. Like it's just, no, no, no. People have preferences. People are biased towards certain pathways in jiu-jitsu. You found your bias. And then um, even though you're not consciously thinking about it, but if I had to narrate this, this is what I would say you're doing. And so the only difference is you now have to do it on purpose. That's the only difference. The second you own it and start doing it on purpose, then you can honestly say that's part of your game or your bread and butter move. You know what I mean? Or your two-piece combo, three-piece mm. combo. The only difference between what you that three-piece combo that you do now Versus the three-piece combo that you do a second later is whether or not you call it your game or not. Right now, there's a lot, a lot of people that are doing awesome techniques that are repeated and repeatable, but they just don't see it. They don't realize that it's, that's what's happening. 
the second you recognize it and you start doing it on purpose now, consciously, boom, that's your game, you know? So that's what it is, you know? That's what it is. Yeah. So uh, there, there's, there's a lot of scenarios in which leg locks are awesome for you. Just know that there is also scenarios where it's really bad for your progress, you know? So it, it becomes a nuanced conversation when you start bringing up like ankle locks and stuff, but I'm, right, I'm right. for it. Like, like you said, the rule set stuff, you know, black belts, I believe starting this year, the black belts can do heel hooks at the, at the IBGF tournaments. No gi. Uh, that's a good question. I didn't really look into it. I think it is because I think we were talking about this before. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I mean, think, I think it's just no gi. Yo, but, heel hooks and a gi would be crazy, right? Uh, I think they should be legal. Why? Yeah. Why is it that they're not? Uh, it's like, it's just a simple, like, it's just, this is very typical in like martial art federations. They, they have a philo philosophy of what's too dangerous. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, they think that, so is, if reaping is illegal, heel hooks definitely are illegal because then they're, they, they work by destroying the knee. So, right. um, uh, it's just, it's, it, it's just like a dogma at this point. You got to keep in mind the yeah. history of leg locks in jujitsu. So this this might be uh this might be helpful in a like a remember we talked about like what is the appropriate way to like to to do a trial at a gym, like what is the best way to visit a gym? Like that's something we should right, probably right. Co record one day. But um, uh, so there's a lot of context that a lot of new guys are missing. That if 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 I just tell you the truth and reality of what's going on, you would you would know that there's a right and a wrong way to test out a school, right? Same thing with techniques that you choose to do. You don't, most people don't realize there is context to technique. For instance, leg locks in the late 90s and early 2000s was considered like the ultimate, like, like this. Like, it's like you coming up to me and start talking shit about my mom. You know what I mean? Like, uh, leg locks were seen that way. It would, it would, it would be fighting, fighting shit. Like, you go for a leg lock in a jiu in a jiu tournament or, or, or a gym back in the day. Dude, everyone's just start stomping you out. Like that's just, I mean, that's just maybe it wasn't widespread, but it's it was a Brazilian perspective. Like in Brazil, like it was not, it was like some pussy shit. Like what the fuck are you? Yo, doing? I did that once while I was I was visiting a gym that was like mostly a Brazilian gym, and um, bro, and I went <laughs> and I went for a knee bar. Oh no. They were they were nice dog, but but it's funny to have the contact sort of context now. You know, they were just like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't we don't do that. We yeah, so I see this all the time, like white belts, blue belts. Remember, I said when things don't work out, the way like they they they're hitting walls and fundamental stuff like passing and sweeping. What do they do? They go straight to leg locks, right? So to to them, they're like they don't realize that's what they're doing. So, but the guys who've been there done that, we look at them as like, first of all, you're fucking up because you're not doing your fundamentals. Second of all. You don't know the context of leg locks. Like this is in some circles, like you're just spit in my face because because the perspective was that is insanely dangerous. Like the even the, straight ankle locks, just like leg locks in general. Touch my leg. It's it's a it's a it triggered a lot of people back in the day because the, it was the leg lock game is unique in that it, the the risk factor is high for people who don't know how to do them. Okay, so my coach told me like he literally saw someone go for a heel hook. Uh, in sparring one in brazil just for funsies they just want to do it they had no idea what the fuck they're doing the dude didn't crank it the dude they didn't fall and do anything they just the guy tapped out right when he did it and he's like whoo that was that was interesting that was fun he stands up he walks and his knees dislocates as he walks off the mat you know what i mean and then um like I, that was his experience and that's the story he told me and ever since then like i think this is one of those things where like it just gets perpetrated like it, like this is a perpetual perspective of leg locks as being like inherently more dangerous than say an arm bar or triangle but the reality is in my opinion nowadays it's like anything could be dangerous if you don't know enough about it you know like alcohol could be dangerous for a kid who's never had alcohol and then he goes to college that could be dangerous you know like growing up in the hood like i had homies that were their parents were giving them tequila shots at like 13, 14. You know what I mean? But guess what? When they're in their 20s, they're either Wake full up blown. With a tequila shot. Yeah, they're either full blown alcoholic or they're the most chill, fun guy to hang out with at the party, you know, like handles his shit. So uh, it's like me personally, the heel hook being okay is like awesome because now um, it, we're starting to walk away from that context, that historical context of being weird. 
to now doing this, allowing heel hooks in jujitsu at this level is the number one thing I've seen in a while that says um, that opens up jujitsu to a whole new like evolution. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I love it. I love the idea. I think there should be, everything should be legal. Like uh, maybe there's some techniques that, that come around once in a while that I'm like, yeah, that's arguably just very, very dangerous. You know what I mean? Like the scissor, the scissor sweep. Or that's the scissor takedown, whatever. Exactly what I was th- imagining, actually. Like, I've seen so many people get hurt doing that. And I'm like, okay, yes, allow this at black belt. I'm not even saying you should make it illegal. I'm just saying, like, make it allowed at when people are more experienced, you know? Like, yeah. for instance, jumping guard is illegal at white belt. Wrist locks, illegal at white belt. Like, but is it illegal? No. It's just, you just need to be more experienced. And I and I feel, I fuck with that. That's, I like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um. Bro, so, so the other the other thing that I'm that I was thinking about in terms of like where to add into my game and where to fit them in. So this is this is kind of similar to what we were talking. I don't remember if we were recording, but um, with the thing that like lower belts try tool and they're like uh, tool doesn't work next tool. Tool doesn't work for me next tool. Right. So I'm trying to balance that with actually learning about like what is is what I'm best at, like what's best for my body, right? Because mm-hmm. I think that the game that I've been attracted to is not necessarily the best game for my body. Um, okay, got it. But, and so, so what makes me think that is the, the success I have with something like, uh, like knee cut. I've been having a lot of success with knee cut, especially yeah. when I focus on like being heavy, like really keeping weight on okay. the guy until I establish like the, you know, I'm past the knee shield, my grips are strong and I can, I can finish the pass. Um, uh-huh. And and just other things that are kind of like big guy things, right? I'm a little heavier now than than I usually am, so maybe that that's part of it. But because of because of this, I I've been thinking a lot about like single legs and and messing messing single legs uh-huh. up. And I know that you are big time heavy heavy fucks with the single leg. I fucks with the single leg, um, <laughs> bro. So so where? So I guess my, my question, so my, what I was thinking about is no gi situation. Like if I'm in a position where your leg is in between my legs and I can get your weight backwards, like single leg, right? Well, like let's, let's start with the scenario. So like you're knee cutting, you're on bottom or top, and then we can walk through that. Okay. So I'm saying I'm on bottom. Okay. And they're knee cutting you. Um, no, let's say that, uh, like. I don't know what, okay. Yeah. Knee cutting. Okay. <laughs> so you, you, you actually had a scenario where it's like, okay, I'm on bottom. So now we're talking about like, uh, yeah, so th- this, sorry. No, we're, now we're talking about how do we approach building a system for yourself? Right. And so right. like we paint the scenario, we start here. Uh, uh, you're on bottom. The guy goes knee cut on you. And then your different your categorization for going the one way or the other is based on where they put their weight. Right. Okay. Well, um, yeah, where they put their weight or where you can put their weight. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially where the balance ends up being. Right. Whether it's from you like or them. if the weight is on the front leg or the back leg. If I feel like if the weight is on the back leg, I can stand up for a single leg. Okay. All right. So Here's the reality of the situation. If you're asking me about single leg there, uh, so do you already have the leg, like arm wrapped around their leg once they knee cut? Uh, wait, so can can we actually, can we not do knee cut? Can okay. we not do it from knee yeah, cut? Yeah, we can switch L- it up. Like, like say, um, say like combat base sort of thing. Like they're they're engaging in a pass. Okay, and you're on bottom? And like I'm on bottom, they're engaging in a pass and yeah. we're like in the hand fighting, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the situation I'm envisioning, which is like ideal situation is I push, am I... Am I, dude? Am I like totally beat? Is this we'll like way out. off? Yeah. The, the situation <laughs> I'm envisioning is like pushing the back leg back, right? Like the Delaheva sit up sort of thing. Okay. Um, and and then from there, scooping the leg and standing up. All right. So when you say combat base, what are you imagining? Are they squatting or is one knee down? Like, what are you what are you imagining? I was kind of imagine. Um. Does it matter? Think, Why uh, does it matter? It does matter. It's it's because then, uh, um, uh, fuck. There's there's a 
there's a logical fallacy where people are like, if it's not this, then of course it means this, right? So it's like, if it's not, if, if this is not happening or like, if we find ourselves here, then of course I have to do this. The reality is jujitsu, there's so many possibilities that like, that you can find arguably easier ways to approach the scenario that doesn't involve a single leg or not. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. like, when combat. I think, when I think combat base, I think one, per, they, you're on your ass or maybe you're on your back, right? You're, you're arguably on the bottom. The top guy, he's not standing over you, but he's actually squatted in front of you with one knee on the floor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the things that like JT Torres does is De La, De La X. So like he'll, go, oh. he'll do a De La Hiva, but he'll put that like hook through to the far side knee. Yeah, in yeah, that scenario, yeah, yeah. And it force, like force you to like not be able to step forward or get up. So then he sweeps you from there, right? Uh, for me, I don't, I, my legs are short, so I can't do the Heva X. What I do is I, I sit up to my ass and I use both my hands and I push you in the chest. Right. So there's two things that's going to happen. They're either going to fall through a butt and then I, I get an immediate, easy two point sweep, or it forces them up, which is where I come in on a single leg and finish the sweep that way. So it looks it more like a takedown. It. How does it force them up? So like, imagine, oh, they they stand, they scramble to not yeah, lose they, their base. To catch their base, they actually elevate and stand up to their feet. And while they're elevating, I'm already moving forward. So it's really simple. Do I, do I hook the leg and then come up with them to finish like a single leg takedowns, aka sweep, single leg sweep, or uh, are they just going to topple over where I'm ready to start passing? You know what I mean? So. And even in that scenario, the single leg is relevant, but it's, it's I don't lead with it. Like, um, or I could actually, a lot of people do do that. But for me, I find it very efficient to just push people. You feel me? Like you can generate a lot of power by pushing. One of the things that I'll ask you is this. In jujitsu, how often do you see people push? Like literally what you would imagine a bully push someone like two hands on their chest and shoulder and just yeah, yeah, push yeah, him yeah. forward. You know? Not that often. But Not I that often. Right? It's mad funny, man. <laughs> Yo, and you like make them like... <laughs> <laughs> it's mad funny. Dude, I do that all the time because uh, I've done it so much. I see scenarios in which I could do it. And then thus it opens up the mind to like, what, how often can you do it everywhere? Um, so imagine this. You Bro, sit up. That's, that's the ultimate year beat, dude. They're yeah, yeah. Like, no, it's, it's like, awesome because I, it's awesome because when I do it to people, they're beat. like, I didn't know you could do that. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they're like, that was so easy that you swept me so easily. Like it makes me re rethink the combat base. You know what I mean? Like, uh, let me put it this way. I've, I don't do combat base anymore. Like, that's just not what I do. I never do that shit. You know what I mean? It's either both my knees are on the ground or they're not on the ground at all. Mm. You feel me? So like, um, because you know, the reason why people developed, uh, reverse De La Hiva, you know, like you've heard of kiss of the dragon where they like invert in between your legs and they take your back. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. That's a result of people combat basing, pretty much. You know what I mean? Like, reverse De La Hiva is a result of open guard, but also a lot of times it's really effective when someone's combat basing, like one knee on the floor. Right. Uh, the reality is, like, if that dude put both his knees on the floor, there is no reverse De La Hiva, you know? So right. um, it's more about me thinking about ways to simplify the game. So it's like it's I'm not allowing other people to have an advantage, you know? Um, so there's that. But uh, yeah, like consider that option. But the main thing is the single leg there is powerful, uh, whether their weight is forward or not. If they're leaning back, you can hook their calf, right? Imagine that one knee that's up. You can hook that calf and then use your other hand to push them forward. And then they can't step back and they fall, right? So that's a combination of single leg and the, the bully push that right, I'm talking right. about. But then if they're leaning into you, if they're coming in at you, I get that single leg and I shuck them with my shoulder and then I take their back. Mm -hmm. Like allow them to go forward, forward, forward. And then I just shuck them, forcing them to put their hands on the floor. Like, fuck, you just, you just kicked me forward. And then while their mm -hmm. hands are on the floor, I'm coming up and then like finishing the sweep or taking their back. Um, I think, I think a, a, a better way to ask a question might be what conditions have to be there for the single leg to be viable. Mm. Uh, I'll put it this way. So can I give a little, so the reason that this comes yeah. to mind is because I was watching Kanan and how he comes up in the single legs all the time where he has the pant grip. I think it was Kanan, the pant grip and the collar grip. And yeah, just, that's right. That's right. DeAngelis does that too from Autos. So clean, dude. The collar Very grip clean. with the pant grip. So <laughs> clean, dude. It's so clean. I personally don't like to do it because it's like, it's, it, 
there's a lot of room for you be able to like power through it. Like as far as the guy perpetrating the crime, like, mm-hmm. you know, you get the grip and you can just be like mad strong and just make it happen. Right. right. Um, obviously there are technical ways to do it. Like there, there's a, there's a window of being technical and there's a big ass window of being strong about it and just forcing it, which uh, Kanan is a monster and all this other stuff. I like that. Uh, just know that for regular folk, like it, the window's a little smaller. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you got to look at, so when you, in this regard, you got to look at uh, Lucas Lapri. He doesn't just hit it from everywhere like uh, DeAngelis and Kanan can. Like what he does is he sets up a really advanced De La Hiva and then like he really breaks down their base and then he comes up. Whereas whereas I've seen Kanan, like the guy has awesome base, perfect base, and the dude just sweeps him from there. I've seen that. So uh, just know that like in your situation, if you have the grips, you're going to start going for it and you're going to realize you're sort of like stuck. So the reality is you get the grips, break their base, and then you come up. You're going to have better – you're going to – by making sure and being disciplined about breaking the base first, you have a real fighting chance of allowing this to grow and then be part of your game. You, you, mm. you give yourself a better chance to see this becoming effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so the root of the question, what conditions need to be necessary for the single leg, is like where should I start looking for to add yeah. this into my game? Beautiful. Like j- this is a great question for – ankle locks too like where can i be to where mm. i feel f- comfortable to just go for it and the, the reality is when you're on bottom so let me let me tell you a few places where i get single legs it's um i'm on bottom side control you oompa and you you shoot your underhook and instead of going underhook the the ribs you un, you underhook into a single leg you see that so i'm um, on bottom like side. under the butt yeah, you know how, like, you oompa to underhook the, the armpit? But instead of the armpit, right. you just go for the thigh, and you come up to turtle. Okay. And then that's single leg. that You can force the sweep from there. It, it, this is also relevant when you're playing De La Hiva, where, like, you know, you have your De La Hiva hook on the close knee, and then your other foot's, like, pushing his hip, so he's, like, diagonal. Right. Well, all right. you got to do is get your butt back, and you shoot in for a single, and you can fight up to come up. Right, you know? right, right. I do this in uh, half guard in general. I do this off of a knee shield. I do this off knee cut defense. I do this anytime I can access the leg. It's a perfect candidate for uh, going for the uh, single leg sweep. So it, you access the leg and then break the base. Do you have yeah, to break the base actually, if you're doing? Yes, you're right. I don't break the base and go for the leg. I get the leg. So I do everything I can to get the hook because it's like this giant clamp. Once you get the single leg, it's very difficult for the guy to break out. It's very, very difficult. Um, uh, but it is very easy for them to feel like their weight is um, overbearing. Like you can't do nothing uh-huh. about it. The reality right. is don't fall for the novelty of feeling stuck. There's a difference between feeling stuck and being stuck, right? They once In it, both scenarios, you both feel stuck. But if you know that you can get out, you know the pathways to get out, that feeling of being stuck it, it, it ain't no thing to you. You see what I'm saying? For instance, let me put it this way, like, you know when someone does a double collar like choke on you from guard or whatever, and then they're uh-huh. squeezing and you feel uncomfortable, but you know like I'm not gonna go to sleep, so I'm just gonna let them burn out. You know what I mean? Just uh-huh. because you feel pressure on your neck, it feels like you you're getting choked doesn't mean you're getting choked, right? So the number one issue you're gonna have is number one, get the leg. Once you have the leg, you don't have to be in a rush, but um, accept the fact that you're gonna feel like you're being crushed. In that scenario, that, that's when you ha- that's where the real learning begins on the single leg. Because if you can move your body when you're getting crushed, you're going to be able to move them when you're not crushed. You feel me? So, uh, for instance, you, they got the knee cut. All their weight is on me, bro. And I have a, a hook on their thigh with my arm. Dude, there's so much you can do. You can, use your, you can employ your left shoulder to shuck them forward. To toss their uh-huh. weight off exactly, and then what happens? Your elbow comes up, and then so now you're doing this whole elbow shoulder shuck, this massively powerful push from their right. thigh to make them off balance. But the second their hands are on the floor, that means their weights on their hands, meaning you can just come up. Or there's other things that Bernard Fard does, which is he puts his knee, like the top of his thigh, on your ass. So he's like a little ball like this, and then he shucks with his shoulder. And then he kicks you with his knee, and then that like launches you forward, and then you can come up. So there's so many things that you can. That's do from half guard. From half guard, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's really really effective. It's something I avoided for so long. 
um, I, I, I learned single leg what as a wrestler, right? And then like my whole entire time in jiu-jitsu has always been energy management. I was never been an athlete. I've always been like as technical as I can be because I, I could barely like, like my cardio sucks. You know what I mean? So I always avoided because single legs were very much like a very exhaustive process in wrestling. But in jiu-jitsu, it's totally different. A single leg is a means to latch onto somebody. And then once they're in a very, when, once they're on the inside, it limits their movement. But at the same time, you have a very clear uh, route of escape. So the single leg in wrestling is a means to capture, to take him down. But in jiu-jitsu, it's a means to capture. So, you've, so you, you sort of narrow their escape plan. And that's what it is. That's, the, that's what's great about the single leg in jiu-jitsu. Beast, yeah. Beast, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. This is the thing. Like, we're, gonna, we're gonna we're talking a lot about it, but like, you're gonna have to do it, and then you're gonna have to come back and ask me these questions again, because you're just gonna be like, right, oh, right. I feel stuck, dude. And I'm like, yes, that's what you want. As long as oh, you that's have- what I wanted to ask. Yeah. So that's so when so from whatever. So say like turtle, right? So yeah, turtle. You see the leg in front of you. You clamp, right? And you're clamping like this. Ah, uh, okay, like got gotcha. Gable yeah. grip. Yeah, yeah, Gable. Um. And then, so the guy sprawls heavy on top of you, but you say you still, and the leg goes back uh, a little bit, but you okay. still have the clamp. Okay. Are you? Am I still in single leg position if I'm extended? So technically you are. Point? Technically you are, but like in a jiu-jitsu. So that's the only time your your single leg will be stretched out like that. You know, your arm is like straight forward. Your elbows are straight. Uh-huh. Like you go for the single, they sprawl heavy and their legs are back, but you technically have your arms interlinked. Technically a single leg. You can still finish that. In wrestling, that would just mean like push forward. Right, run them over, but in jujitsu, it's guess what? You have them contained. You just don't have them contained as tight as you'd like. So your your pathway is more open for you and them. So the idea is you don't want it, the legs. So you have a gable grip, right? You don't want their legs at your wrist. That you want their legs at your bicep, meaning that like you're wrapping your arm around their thigh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Once they're their bice, once your your their knee or their thigh is on your chest, you're in control. I don't care if they're on top of you and they put a million pounds on you. You're the one in control. Because uh, imagine you're the top guy and they the dude on bottom's hugging your thigh, dude. You're gonna you're gonna feel like this is a very scary scenario where I have to be very careful where I put my cross face, where I where I put my weight. Like I gotta recover here. So realize that the top guy is doing that in his head. So the guy on bottom, although it feels like you're stuck, you're not really stuck. So uh, that's what I mean. Like, that's the first thing you're going to notice that you feel stuck. But good question. If the leg is far like this, like you're like, they're about to sprawl in that scenario, you could either um, put the boosters on and just fucking run them over, which I personally won't do because again, energy, energy management. What I do in that one, I do, uh, uh, the uh, Chael Sonnen, Damien Maya technique, which Damien Maya went in for a single leg. The dude sprawled heavy. And then he used that openness that now imagine like a triangle, like the guy sprawling on you and your arms are stretched out. You're in turtle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He pulled to half guard. And from there he got right, a deeper right, single right. leg. You know what I mean? So like um, um, I use that to pull. So a lot of times I'll, I'll do a shitty single leg. They do a shitty sprawl, and then I just pull to half, which is what I wanted in the first place because I like this single leg sweep so much. I rather, I rather fake a single leg to get to a, a a half guard to retry a deeper single leg s- sweep, versus taking them down with a single leg because the effort level is way higher off of a takedown than a sweep from bottom. So, so when I'm thinking about like. Um, I'm going for a single leg, and when I'm thinking about uh, like the fight, right? So mm-hmm. in this position. The fight is um, getting the my bicep hooked under the thigh. Mm. From this, from this um, coming up to to a single. I mean, is is that true in, in all single legs? Like, I guess I guess you were saying you're not really in the position until I get the thigh. Like, what is the thing where it's like, okay, I'm I'm here. I, I'm going for a single leg. Let me isolate the fight so I know exactly what I'm looking for and exactly what parts of the position I need to improve to finish it. Does that question make sense? No. Um, <laughs> dude, so the reason, so <laughs> I, um, it was, it comes from like uh, a John, I was watching a John Donahue interview. Okay. And he said that in his, and uh, that's like the point of his systems is that he says, or not the point of his systems, but you get to, you get to a point and he's like, this is the position you're in. The fight now is risk control. And so that 
that kind of like was driven home in I think it was Gordon Ryan Buchecha match where Gordon Gordon is like in his position and he's yeah. just like he's like uh he's comfortable so stubborn fun. but he's unwilling to move on until he gets this grip that he needs and Buchecha okay. won't let him get the grip so he's yeah. fighting for the grip Buchecha gets away he resets comes yeah. back fights for the grip again so is there an, an analogous thing in the single leg where it's like I'm yeah. not moving on to finish the sweep until I get X. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So check this out. Remember I said like people, so we can extrapolate this concept to like in uh, the DDS, like they have a, what they've done is this concept and then they put a, they put a position to it. If that makes sense. Like it's a, like, the, like a concept is be a good person, but then with, within DDS, their definition of a good person starts at blank. You know what I mean? Mm, like mm, uh, mm. going to the gym, you know what I'm saying? So it's like the concept is works. Um, it's, They'll argue that the Juji the Juji the Ashigarami whatever is the uh-huh. is the is their hub. That's their starting or that's and that's single work, leg X, right? Ashigarami. Something uh no, Ashigarami is like a the leg entanglement is a, in a different position. Okay. That's uh-huh. all you gotta think about. All right. Okay. So they so I can see their concept. I didn't hear, I don't know what literally what he said, but going off what you said, like it sounds like their mission is to get there, and then that is their like base. From there, they feel confident they're going to be defend. They know how to defend and attack from that position, and so they're very hard. They're from there, their game really starts. If you can think about that as a concept, that really can apply to any position. You know, it really the question is, what is your favorite position? Oh, I love half guard. Like Lucas Lucas Leitch, he's half guard. So like you can still apply that concept, which is I'm working to my strongest position, and this is my home base, and then I'm going to work from here. Same thing with if you go to tenth planet, it would be the rubber guard. If you go to, uh, like, if you go to, um, uh, who's really good? At, so if you go to the Mendes brothers, it'd be the back position. Well, like, once I have the back, it, I'm it, in my territory. You know what I mean? Same thing. Like, if, uh, Mikey Musumeci has your ankle. It's his territory. He can turn into, it's a whole different position from that point on. He knows what happens if you roll this way, roll this way. I'm looking for this position against my rib. My elbow's doing this. Like, this is what I mean. So, like. Everyone does this. Like, this is the advice I give to white belts. I say, we're going to start from full guard because it's the most foolproof position to start your hub, right? Like, um, if, you, if, you're, if, you, um, if you were starting a business, it makes sense that you find areas where it's more successful for your business to succeed, like increase the chances of your business to, to succeed. So if you had like a flower shop, it makes sense that you don't start in the middle of the ocean, Right. Or if you have a flower shop, it makes sense you don't start in the middle of a desert. If there's a flower shop, you start in, in a downtown area across the street from a major office building. Does that make sense? So like in jiu-jitsu, we have to think about it that way. The guards or the positions that you feel should feel comfortable should be right off the bat areas where you're set up for success. So f- for white belts that have nothing, start with nothing, you have to start them at full guard because you have a, a really good shot. It's, it's very linear. Like, you know, to keep your ankles straight and you're gonna, they're going to be in your guard. Okay, conceptually, that makes sense. From there, you can work on defense, like how to prevent. So guard retention is defense in full guard, but it's also chokes and arm bars and setups is the offense in full guard. Similar to Ashigarami, like they can move and set up grips in a way where if you, if you don't fall for the first ankle lock, they'll go for the second or the, th- you know what I mean? They'll go back and forth. Mm-hmm. So in your Senate for Bernardo Faria is single leg or a deep half guard. So if his mm-hmm. arm is wrapped around your leg, he's so comfortable there. He is not rushing. He has five different plant pathways to success. Or if he puts you in a deep half, he has five different pathways of success there. That is his hub. DDS, their hub is Ashigurami or back take. But in Bernardo Faria's world, it's deep half guard, single leg. If it's uh, the Mendez is De La Hiva and uh, back takes. You know what I mean? Like you got to realize mm-hmm. like while people are a pro- are attracted to high level black belts and like their games and that's like, that's, well, that's the truth. It's, it's, they don't focus on the concept that got them there, the, these high level guys. They focus on where they are. So like as a, as a new, newbie in jiu-jitsu and I'm like trying to find the best, most objectively powerful game, you look at DDS and be like, oh, it's clearly the Ashigrami. I'm going to do that. But if you suck at Ashigrami, no matter how many times you drill, and you're like, if I can't be good at Ashigrami, I'm not going to be good at Jiu-Jitsu. You see how ridiculous that sounds? So you have to find what works for you, find the hub, and then that 
you're uniquely positioned to do well in that position versus say an objectively powerful position. Just because objectively powerful doesn't mean that you'll it'll be powerful for you. Yeah. So for me, my objectively powerful position is just half guard. Like I do a lot of stuff in half guard. I hated half guard white to brown. I hated it, but because of the single leg position, it, I feel so much more powerful. And um, it's is it is what it is. The second is Kimura traps. Like you, I I train for the Kimura trap. I feel comfortable with Kimura trap. I know how to be defensive with the Kimura trap, but also know how to be offensive. So that's my area. You know what I mean? What I'm trying to tell people is like. This is what we mean by building a game. Figure out the position that you're strong in and then build it from there. And then here's the reality. As you get more and more experience, you're going to ditch one position and go to another. That's just right, the fact. Right, right, But you sort Dude, of... kind of... I'm kind of getting more into half guard now and away okay. from the guards we talked to before. Yeah, I yeah, I fuck with that. And then before you know it, it might become some other guard. But the re reality is we have to latch onto something now so we can start building now. And then eventually from mm -hmm. in a year or two or even six months, you're like, you know what? I found something else I want to try. Go do it. But the reality is it should right. be a progression. Know why you're doing it. Like know if, and if that why is, doesn't make sense. Or you, you ask someone who's been there, done that. And you, this is the why I want to approach this. And they're like, yeah, it makes sense. Do it. And it's like, okay, that's pretty much all the validation you need. You know, you you talk to your teammates and you use them and then you just go for that. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. yeah, this is why like, you know, that, that guy you're talking about before, the younger guy, he was 100% broom below and it's working so fucking hard for it, you know? It's because he knows that that's very effective and he's trying to he's trying to force a square peg in a circle hole trying to, you know? Some people will get through that and be like, this is my game now and I love it. But then other people are going to realize like it just doesn't fit and then you can move on. You know what I mean? So that's... That's active. That's active. That's what jujitsu is. You're constantly trying th things out. Right, the, right, right. The problem is when you try everything out and you never figure out that hub. You think that just by trying new techniques and new things all the time, you're learning and experiencing. And it's true. But the only way you're going to get better is to be a specialist. Simple as that. The people who specialize are the people who get better at jujitsu. Simple as that. Yeah. If you're okay at everything, you're not really good at anything. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it, it is what it is. Like, that's one thing that people mistake. Like I talked to a lot of black belts that have, in my opinion, it's a mistake, right? So this is all for me, but they will say, yeah, but my ultimate, I'm not trying to be a competitor. I'm trying to uh, uh, teach for a living. So I want to make sure that I know enough about everything. So my students can have a uh, honest shot at learning things in general, but it's like, look, that's, I, I had that mentality too, where it was like, I was attracted to new shit. All the yeah, time, new, 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 new. Oh, I've never seen that. Let me try it. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's cool. And the reality is, uh, if you look at all the best competitors, or, or another proxy for best competitor is the best jujitsu people. They're famous for something. They're famous for a position. They're famous for uh, uh, like a sub or something like that. They specialized, right? So, which is something I heard about the DDS guys that it's not even them. It's that like that their coach specializes too. Well, well uh, uh, I think what I heard is that everyone in that gym has the same game so that their coach is teaching the system. The system, right? yeah. Yeah, but um, um, it's, it's tough though because I've, ta I've, I've heard them talk about it too, about that. And it's a, it's a strategic decision, competitive strategic decision for them to say that. Because uh, like, for instance, the latest ADCC, it was like, um, in the very beginning, they thought DDS was a leg lock game. And now we're right. showing them that it's a back system. Then we're going to show right. them it's the full guard system. So what they're doing is they're using their concept, which is true and un unchanged. But the, the application of that concept is constantly changing. Okay. So it's a competitive advantage. The, one of the competitive advantages of competing is doing something that they are not expecting. So the element of surprise, right? You... Everyone has this, there's a history of leg locks being weird as fuck and like no one really cares about it, especially gi. And then all of a sudden these guys come out and they all they do is leg locks. So they have a competitive advantage. They're specializing in something that people are not really taking seriously, right? And then, so then they're killing people. What uh, happens really? as, a, as a butterfly effect is other people like, just like they're like leg locks? That's the, that's the, they figured out the fucking secret. Let's go. What happens the following year? When 
or like a couple of years later when everyone's trying to catch up now you you're you're seeing tournaments more people doing leg locks blah 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 and then what do you see the DDS guys everybody's doing? back Taking everyone's taking back. it yeah he's taking everyone's back so, so even they're so far that's right so it's the ultimate deception and i'm not saying it in a negative way it's brilliant like um what they're what they what they don't specify is the concept is unchanged it's the positions that they're changing you you so the concept is minimizing the fight right the concept is taking all the variables down and minimizing it down yeah. to a few variables where it's like i get this then i proceed i get this then i proceed yeah and so that at no point am I, am I confused about the next step? Exactly. Exactly. But this is something that's been known for a really long time. I would say the number one thing that they do is do a really good job of being explicit and following their own philosophy. There's a lot of people that understand this as a philosophy to improve and be good. But then on one day, they'll show this technique on the next day, they'll show that technique on this, you know, just because you understand the concept doesn't mean you're staunchly like, um, uh, like perpetrating that concept. You know what I'm saying? My my interpretation of DDS is they have a small group of guys in a big gym. In the big gym, you might learn this, this, and that. But with amongst a small group of high level competitors, they are building a system out. Like, no, when they go for this hook this way, you have to do it this way because we figured out that this is the most effective way to do it. Or or John Danaher did, and or just the whole squad did. And then so they what makes them super unique as well is they follow the concepts that they they laid out. But they also test everything so well, like the, the training is so specific that they have an answer to every, every type of potential response. So again, go back to that concept of, you know, by being in a hub position, you make you, you kill a lot of variables and you make things really clear for yourself, right? But again, it goes into also if the answers, if the potential problems that come up is systematized, your answers are systematized then we can bring other people up to speed much quicker. And then there's this thing, there's this package. Now they sell the package, not, you know, DVDs, they sell it, literally sell it. But I'm talking about when they enter tournaments, they'll follow the game. What they realize is everyone else is a step behind. So they'll follow their, they'll pick up on the, on the signal that they just released to the world. But by the time that these guys are ditching their own core games to do this new shit and get proficient in this new shit, They've already been working, doing something, working out some other position that they're going to like send another signal out with. You know what I mean? So what they're doing mm -hmm. to the entire jutsu world is they're making them play catch up the whole time. Right, right. And that's my interpretation of this whole thing. Like there's a reason why Gordon Ryan came out with the full guard DVD and like he's, he's giving you clues of the positions that he himself sees as a strength of his. You know what I mean? But the reality is this is, Gordon is – a unique individual, just like Gary Tonin's a unique individual. They do not spar the same. They do not roll the same. They do not compete the same. They don't. They don't have exact games. Certain areas of it, they're exact. But then there, there's others where it's unique as fuck. Like uh, uh, Gary Tonin's uh, takedown defense is uniquely Gary Tonin's. You know what I mean? But it's the concept that's unchanging. So this is why these conversations are so important because once you can like break down what's happening, you can sort of like, oh. And then you can either decide, is this a trap for me to follow this new trend? Or is it arguably a smart decision to do it? You know, and people so can come here's up with the reasons thing, why. Here's the thing that's so frustrating, man, is that as like, so as we do this, we do this, uh, we think this through, we reach a solution and then we're like, okay, application time, right? Figure mm -hmm. out. And then you, you have your system, you think it through and you're, you're trying to apply and play with it. Then, then you go to you go to training and it's like you're taught a different technique you drill that different technique or you do that different technique for like 45 minutes of the hour and a half training and then maybe you get four rounds to try out what you've been wanting to try out right yeah. that's so frustrating hey, it is what it is like you got to realize like in G so do you think a college you know when you think about college and like any class like there's just general patterns where you go into a room there's a professor in the front and everyone's staring at the professor and he's got a fucking chalkboard or whatever and he's teaching, right? I would say that's pretty optimized for learning, but is it the absolute best way to learn? Probably not. You know, the best way to learn is having individualized curriculum for every individual and having a right, unique right, professor right. for each person, right? <laughs> so you got to right. realize that in a teaching environment, in a learning environment, there's compromises. Right. Just because this is the best way to learn, we all agree that this is the best way to learn. Colleges... Being in a room, having access to the instructor, whatever, is the best 
realistic approach, but conceptually it'd be better if there was 50 uh, professors for those 50 students and they're getting individualized uh, 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 care and guidance and mentorship and uh, homework to do and whatever, right? But you don't even really need an individual professor. Like all you need is just freedom to not do the technique they want to teach. For who the though? For who? The kindergartner? Kindergartner needs freedom? You know what I mean? Like you got to. Yeah, right. So that's so because classes are, are taught to to or tend to be if you're not at a place where it's like you're being sponsored or whatever. Right. Then classes are taught to the most common student. And the most common student right. is someone who started. This is why we have an SAT. You know what I mean? Like like we need a standardized testing because we really don't know where each individual's at right so like so this is what i'm saying you know you talked about the issues with class at jiu-jitsu and like yeah but you know the way it is right now like there's definitely things that can be changed to improve the experience for all the difference is how do we really maximize the potential for each right and that's the difficulty this is why private lessons are a necessity in jiu-jitsu like Necessity as far as people have benefited a lot from it. I'm not saying you have to, to become a black belt or whatever, or gain that black belt proficiency. I'm just saying like, it exists for a reason. You know what I mean? There are, there are flaws in the teaching process. Like um, when I teach classes, I've taken so much notes on like what I hated about class and what I did, what I would do better. And I, and I actually, my classes tend to be run quite differently than the classes I've historically been in. So I have my own unique approach, but I've also had some areas where I was a clear, okay, clearly this is the best way to do it. I do it and I realize just for the instances of teaching 20 people today, I have to go back to one of an archaic method that I even identify as archaic, but it's effective for all. Not, it might not be for each, but it's effective for all. And also like, for instance, you know, like let's say you learned an arm bar, right? You don't think that that coach He's like, he's like teaching, you know, do an arm bar. He's like, okay, grab the arm here, grab the wrist. We're going to pull the elbow, uh, put your hand on the, the shoulder. And that's like 10 steps. But um, uh, you don't think a black belt can teach you uh, arm bar in 50 steps. Like they can get super, super nuanced. But right, do you think that's, right, right. but just because they can, and just because conceptually it makes sense to like give me everything. Does that mean that that's the best way to learn? No. One of the things about jujitsu is you have to make mistakes and then come back with relevant questions afterwards. You feel me? Like one of the things I tell people is like, look, I can tell you the answer, but if it's not a problem of yours, you're not going to see it as the answer. It's going to go one ear out the other, right? So I need you to have a problem. I need to give you just enough to get you going. And then you run into problems then you come back. Then that answer, I would have told you in the very beginning that would have went in and out the ear. Now is settling in the brain because you've, de you actually understand the problem now. You know what I mean? So um, it's really, really complicated. So my thing on the class is do what, so this goes back to the individual. This is why I, the advice is not for coaches, is not for whatever. Like I, obviously, I'm always looking for ways other people teach class to improve my students' experience. But the quickest way for you to get the most out of class is realizing where you have freedom and then exploiting that freedom. Okay, for instance, like uh, this is something I say just very like quick thing i say to people is like hey when you're a brown belt do you do you actually expect to learn something in class like when you're a white belt every class is probably something you learn something new whether you wanted to whether you liked it or not you learn something like oh that's how you get out of an arm bar oh shit you know what i mean i've been doing it this way right even if you don't that thing that you saw that you never saw even if you never do that at least you've seen it and you're like okay if someone does that to me i got you know whatever right but at purple belt and up how many times have you or even as a blue belt, right, Andrew? Like, as a blue belt, how many times have you been to class? And he's like, I've seen that before. Fuck, I got to do this shit now. You know what I mean? How often has that happened? A lot. And then you yeah. you could imagine a well, black Well, a belt. lot of times even it's like, it's like we're be, it's being taught with this variation. And then you're like, okay, but I, I do a different variation for this and this reason. But now I have to drill this other variation. Right, right, right. So, so you got to realize that that is more like, that is the limitations of teaching a group of people. But so the, the rea reality is the responsibility of maximizing your training is on you, right? So sometimes it is true. Like you need to just accept that that's the technique of the day. And you have to accept that this is what we have to drill. And if you drill something else, when the coach is telling you to drill this, you're being disrespectful fuck. You know what I mean? But when it comes to sparring, that's where you sort of have freedom. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'll tell you what, as a yeah. purple belt, brown belt, 
my coach from white to brown, I was training at one under one coach, one school, right? And guess what? He does something that I disagree with. Like people can convince me otherwise. I'm open minded to everything, but I completely disagree with written down curriculum. I completely disagree with that. I think that is so fucking lazy. And like the problem is, I I went to this school from white to brown. Meaning, how do you? How many times do you think I've seen that curriculum? How many times have you? Do you think I've seen that curriculum cycle over and right, over right, right. and over and over? And you're telling me I'm not getting better? Like, of course I'm getting better. And like, of course you pick up on a new detail, but the 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 progression fucking slams to a halt. You're still moving forward, but you're not speeding up, right? So at that point, who's the who's at fault here? The school or the or the uh or the student? The reality is the only thing you can try to talk to your coach about updating the curriculum or even getting away from a curriculum, but the only thing that guarantees change is how you approach the class. Yeah. So to me, there are so many things that you can do. I mean, that can be a whole different thing, but the major thing is realize where you have control and then abuse the shit out of that control. For instance, I'll give you one example. Uh, you, you're learning omoplatas today and you don't give a fuck about omoplatas. You don't care. You can give one, two shits about omoplata. You're, you feel comfortable. You feel comfortable defending omoplatas. You feel com- You don't even like doing whatever. But you want to work on this triangle thing. Well, the the warm-ups, you can't really do nothing about. The, 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 the technique, it is what it is. You got to do the drill and you got to do it the best you can with your partner because if you don't want to do omoplatas but your partner does well you got to fucking do omoplatas there's no choice but when it comes to sparring you have a choice now you can you can start in certain positions you can like ask your partner be like hey i've been working on this you mind doing that or like right right or like you can if it if they do positional sparring where it's only omoplata day where you start in omoplata well then constantly ask them hey we learned an omoplata right so you go ahead you do that i'm just gonna focus on defense and you could do that kind of shit where you can talk to individuals right, and right. other guys are like, hey, honestly, I want to work on defense too. So can we switch? It's like, okay, that's cool. But at least if you have right, to communicate right. with your partner, you have a uh, you have a means to control your own progress. You right, know? right. So yo, someone's having in the bathroom. Give me some right, like water yeah, sure, or something. Sure. All right. So we left right, on maximizing um, training. Yeah. So maximizing yeah, that's sparring. that's an that's advice. Yeah. yeah oh. I need to do better at that. I yeah. need to do better at, at getting to where I want to get in sparring. Like, and it's like, just like, that's like social engineering shit, right? Just. That's it. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I should start using that term. That makes a lot of sense. It's like, there are certain things you can't be, you can't just deny because that's dick. Like coming in late to avoid the warm ups. That's just stupid. Like the fuck, like that's so selfish. You know what I mean? Um, uh, but then there's other things that you can't, you have freedom to do, which is like sparring and like how you spar and like how you approach sparring, the technique that you have in your mind that you want to work on. The only problem is like, it really, really, really depends on like where your level is at. Okay. So right, like, right, right. if you're, a, if you're six months in and you're coming in with like all these bright ideas and then like, I, I, I need you to learn how to get out of side control, but you're like, man, fuck that. I want to do this like Barimbalo fucking, you know what I mean? I'm going to be like, hey, you don't even know how to get a side control, dude. Like, there's priorities, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah, but so, they got the right mindset, right? They they don't because you should know when you're in the beginning, you you should become more of a sponge than anything else. You know what mm. I mean? Uh, like, for instance, if I go to Japan, if I just move to Japan and I'm just like, uh, I should learn Japanese. But you know what? No, 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 no. I'm going to fucking, like, go. To, I'm going to, like start hitting up chicks and like, I got my own ideas, like whatever, like, no, bro. It's probably more efficient to learn Japanese. Yeah, It's probably more efficient for you to learn Japanese. And trust me, when a coach is trying to help you, they're not, what is the best way to make this guy take a lot longer to become black belt? What's the best? They're not thinking that they're thinking, look, this is a long ass journey. Let's try to avoid mistakes. So it's not longer than it needs to be. That's every coach's like perspective on it. Like, uh, like, we want to see you succeed. We want to, because this is such a long road. We want to see you succeed. We want you to level up. We want you to get more responsibilities. We want you to think at a higher level. That's a, like, you know what it feels like to be a coach surrounded by people that are like not black belt level. You're thinking, damn, I just want to be able to them to see what I see. Like, yeah, let's, get it, want too. let's get it up to here. And then we can have real, we can really grow. But like right Yo, now, I you wish just gotta, I could train with you, man. Yeah. So that's, I wish that's, I could train with you so bad. It's all good. She, Do people respect you, bro? Do people give you your respect? Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't. I don't really care. Like, um, I don't respect pe- me. 
like people like this, like people are like, hey, uh, should I call you master or some shit? I'm like, bro, I'm a fucking, <laughs> I'm an idiot, dude. Like just, I, I am your coach. So yeah, call me coach. But you know, this isn't some like cult shit. Like I'm, I'm, this is very much like, I'm an American, you're an American. Like, why the fuck call me master? Like, where do you call master in any other fucking aspect of this? You know what I mean? And some people say, well, that's the tradition. Like, tradition of what? Like, this is not a TMA. This is this is a fairly new martial art. Like, like I get I get the so like why do you have the gi? Then it's like, look, I I can I can argue for the gi. I can argue all day. I can't really argue for you making you call me master. I can't do that. So, um, uh, there's that. Yeah. Another another episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I, um, I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of times you see, we go to a gym and it says world champion or come to this gym. This is where world champion trains, blah, blah, Mm. blah. This guy's a legend in MMA, blah, blah, Mm. blah, man. I wish it could like, there was a, a, like coach K bro. Was coach K good at basketball? I don't think so. Mm. I don't really know. Yeah. But let's say he wasn't for the sake of the thing, right? Like, that's, you know what I mean? I wish there was a way to just be like, enter Denny's mind, right? Yeah, like, Custom Auto, was he a great boxer? Like, Mike Tyson's old, you know, original. Right, right. Was he a great exactly. boxer? Like, who taught Muhammad Ali how to fucking box? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, yeah, there's that. But the reality is, like, uh, jiu-jitsu people are, I, a lot of them tend to be shallow. You can, you can, you can, um, uh, or rather linear in their thinking and then as a result, shallow. Because you can see this by high-level guys opening up gyms and how successful they are right off the bat. They deserve that success. They work their fucking ass off. They deserve it. But the reality is you put yourself in the shoes of the student that signed up. There's a If there's a student that signed up without checking other schools first. Sp- Got him. Yeah. Got him. Sp- you're sp- like how about – And like um, <laughs> it, it's like how about – Signing up for Jim's sight unseen because he's got all the credentials. Oh, this guy's got all the credentials. Why would I need to? Sp- you know what I mean? Because now, nah, Lenny, bro, Lenny actually did OG shit, which was like Jim's right next to my house. I'm signing up. Yeah, no, I I like that. I like that because that, yeah, you're yeah. talking about pragmatic, right? But mm-hmm. like, uh, oh, that's a cool. That must be a great geek because it looks cool. Sp- you know what I mean? Yeah. Clay, so like, Clay. yeah. So it's just like, I, look, <laughs> yes. I'm not saying. I'm not saying, oh, that world champs in my town. Uh, uh, I'm not saying don't go there to try it. You should more, most likely that dude's awesome. But there, there, but you know, here's the thing: the number one thing in jiu-jitsu isn't uh, training under a champion. The number one thing about going to a school is can I see myself training here? Do I like the environment? Is it toxic or not? And then, um, is the coach have my best best interest in mind? Yeah. Yo, so that's like uh, the Bernardo Freya book. He's, oh, really? That's exactly what he said. He really? said, here, I, I actually have it right here. That's he amazing. said, when it, where to train, he says, um, he talks about how happy he was. So he went to a gym in his hometown, which apparently was like a competitive gym. Everyone was like raving about it. It's really good. That, and and the guy, he asked the guy a question and the guy made him feel bad. I'm paraphrasing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. This is very uh, common. He said he was very rude to me. I asked him what time the classes were. He replied very quickly and was quite impolite. Yo, love Bernardo, dude. I love Bernardo. <laughs> yeah, the funniest, dude. And then he went to my friend's coach, uh, met the my first teacher, Ricardo Marquez, who graduated me on my belts. And uh, and he was just very nice, pretty much. And he said, what yeah. time is class? And he said, hmm, for you, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 5 to 6. So he created a new class for him on the spot. <laughs> so, and then he said, if the instructor is, uh, he goes, train where you feel comfortable where the instructor is a nice guy, where you feel that you're in a good environment. Like, you know, that, that was, so that was his advice on where to pick a gym. And this is like world champion, right? One of the yeah. goats. Don't, he said, pick a gym where you feel comfortable. Punto y final. That was all, that was all the advice yeah. he gave. Ah, ever died full. Like for sure. Like my, I, I know a couple of world champs and I actually texted one uh, yesterday and she's, she's, you know, women in jujitsu, they go through a whole different thing. How about sexual harassment and just creepy dudes, right? There's a whole nother layer, right? So this, it go, they- Creepy, bro, creepy. <laughs> look at that, look at them and their experience and what they have to go through to show how much of a sp- it is to just show, to just show up and sign up to a place because the dude's famous. It's like, uh, you could ask her 
and I'm going to see if maybe eventually get her on, but like you could ask her, but like, yo, when you look for a gym and she's super competitive, she, she competes mm. everywhere, right? World champ. And then I'm, and, she, and I asked her, what are you looking for in a gym? She's like, in, it can't be a toxic environment. I have to want to show up to train there. I, cause then I, it's whether the coach there or not, I'm training, like I'm drilling. It's not about the coach. It's like the coach is super, super mm. important, but it's about the team. It's about the environment. It's about, and I'm like, yes, thank you. But she, you got to realize she's also much more experienced. Right. So a lot of people fall into the trap, the novelty of a, of a competitive school or competitor coach. Keep in mind, if the, if the dude is famous and he has his name on the gym, uh, he might not be there all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, I, and when he is there, it's, it's great. I'm just saying like, there are things that you have to take in mind. So like, so Angie, you're looking for gym. And so I said, number one thing, go to as many places you can, because there's, you're going to pick up on things that you didn't even know you cared about. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's my takeaway. You know, when I so, did, you know what my, sorry. Didn't yeah, interrupt. no, go, go. No, I'm good. I'm good. What, what's something that was um, important to me and the, and one of the most recent places I tried out is it just felt like, it felt like a place where it was like very respected, which is how I felt um, at Admars. It was like, I just felt like you go in and it's like, this is like, like, uh, like wholly focused on jujitsu, like mm. jujitsu, only jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. This is like a place where it's like a palace for jujitsu, right? Mm -hmm which is you know when you you can get lost and spend three hours mat time whatever right as opposed to uh some other places i don't feel that yeah yeah no and for so sure. that was just an example that came to mind about something yeah, that was absolutely. important to me. and that goes back into it it's like well i want to i want to know i'm in good hands so i'm going to go to this guy who has credentials and he has all these accolades and like i, I this is what i mean most new guys think that way and then um uh they're attracted to that but again that's shit like Speaking from someone who's been there, done that, <laughs> dude, for real. Speaking from someone who's been there, done that, do yourself a favor and then check out as many gyms as you can. You can would you admit that it's it's just it makes more sense to have more experiences than less experiences? So in that regard, conceptually, it makes more sense to visit as many gyms as you can before you sign on the dotted line. You feel me? And so. Because it's hard. And if any of you guys are thinking about, oh, I can sign up here and later I can sign up over there. Like that's easier said than done because you're going to build family, dude. You're going to people who you trust, people who you look forward to, people who you can invite to barbecues. But they're shit. probably like, homies, right? If they're, yeah. if they're black belts in the same town. Dude, it's like there's, there's so many other things other than this guy's a world champion. You know what I mean? And in jiu-jitsu, there's a lot of world champions because there's masters, adults, there's multiple belts there's there's so many world champions and so um uh like just you know i trained under a world champion and it was awesome but there's there's a lot of uh cultural stuff that worked well for me there you know what i mean so uh you got to keep that in mind it's like uh a school can be across the street from you but you just hate the environment like you dread walking through the doors because you're gonna get bullied or uh they're gonna give you a nickname that you just absolutely hate and you there's nothing you can do about it like yeah, I mean, like, give your give your future self a, a chance to be happy, and then check everything out. Check all your options out, and then do it. That's always been my advice, and that'll always be my advice. It's just there's always something that you don't realize that you want or need, but the only way to confirm is to go there. And so, check as many places out. Yeah, that's my advice on that. So, I got to the point here where it's like I only have another year and six months in this okay. area. Yeah. So. And we talk about like training when you're at a, when you're visiting a new gym, the mentality isn't that you're training, right? You're, you're, you're trying to hack your way into being the homie as soon as possible. So that yeah, that's, the a, homies keep that's a hack. Too. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so from that perspective, for me, it was like, all right, this is months now of, of, or probably like a month. Of, like, like I, you know what I mean? I, I want to get into my routine. I want to start, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and start training, like start getting hard training and feeling like I'm, I'm progressing in that respect. Yeah. So that was one situation for me in which I think it made sense to expedite the gym choosing process. Not that I, not that I didn't already have a long process. Yeah, no, it's all good. Like, obviously you got to take time to do it right. But then there's also like, you're, you shouldn't expect to get, go full out training the first couple times you train somewhere. You know what I mean? So yeah, like I understand like there's a phase, there's like a, get to know them phase and then fucking let's get now we're comfortable let's fucking make out you know what i'm saying so it's right, like right, right. so 
I understand that in a year and a half, that's pretty good time. You know, the reality is like in jujitsu time, that's so short, but at the reality, another reality is you're going to get access to so many people and coaches and you're going to know them and you're going to see them eventually again at a tournament, maybe whatever. It's about building up that community. This is why, this is why I think it's awesome. Like my original coach, he was just like, don't speak to anybody else in other gyms. Just don't do that. So OG. Right. But I always thought that was so dumb. Like I'm part of a community. It would be awesome. Like that's what, and I think that's a benefit. Like I want to learn, I want to meet other people, meet other coaches and see how they do it. And so, cause then it's only going to benefit me. The more experience I have, more it's going to be benefiting me. That's why like when I went, when I lived in Brazil for a little bit, like I, I checked out a lot of gyms, you know, just to see what the vibe is, you know, for sure. It's like tourism, right? And that, that's what it was. So that was really cool. Um, But yeah. Uh, you you nailed it. You know what I mean? Like, do it right, and then get access to the best people you can for you, and then then you go you can go hard. You know. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, man, bro, lost ten pounds. Cut now carbs. I told you that already. What? You know what I me? Mean? I told you that already, right? Yeah, yeah, you told me. Trying to get to two hundred five. Where you at? Two thirteen. Okay, that's easy, dude. I was 220, 223. <laughs> Thick, thick, sneaky thick, too. not even yeah. jack you know not big 220 big. but not jacked is very sad bro. <laughs> i'm uh i'm like two i'm like 213 not jacked never jacked stay stay <laughs> yeah, soft but, club you know I mean? but black belt but black belt not jacked, but black belt. <laughs> yeah but not not all black belts are built equally you know what i'm saying so like you yeah, know you're, you're clean you're one of the cleans no the main thing is this like i really care about helping people that's all i care about like i don't care Mm. about like me doing well in tournaments or whatever like i've lost a lot of matches but i've won some you know what i mean so like uh my whole thing was i compete so i can become a better me which equals a better coach because then my goal is to be the best coach i can right so um my number one thing is just to help people as many people as i can with no bullshit advice you know so uh I, I really hope that like as jujitsu becomes as there's more black belts in America and uh, they they have their own mind and they're not they're not focused on perpetuating their environment that they came up in but creating their own environment I think that's really good for the growth of jujitsu and one of the awesome things about jujitsu is the variability of gym to gym if you go to taekwondo or hapkido or judo it's, it's consistent fairly consistent gym to gym instructed instructors fairly consistent it's rigid in how they come up but with jiu-jitsu is so open i really hope people take advantage of that openness that's so unique in jiu-jitsu to make a, something their own because what's mm. going to happen is you're going to have students that love you more because as they check out and they test different gyms they find the gym that speaks most to them and then eventually if you have a particular culture and attracts certain group of people you have a really strong team you know um, versus I'm the biggest team. That's why you want to join my team. Like, I think that's, no one really says that, but like, it's like inferred, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, mm-hmm. no, it's not, it's not the team that you should be attracted to. It's the environment of that location. So like, you know, some people can be part of a team, but hate the other schools that are part of that team. That's, that's a thing too. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very important. Make the training, find the areas where you can do your thing, where you have control, uh, you have the most control before you sign on the dotted line. And so take advantage of that and then like figure out what you want and then, you know, make a decision after that. Here's uh, que- yo know, question though. Um, feel free to come off. I know we're, we're kind of going late. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bro, rap, jujitsu rat pack. Is that a hack? Yeah, it's a hack for sure. Like, um, it's a hack. yeah. Like for instance, let me, let me put it this way. Like, uh, you you got accepted into a, a major major university, right? You're a PhD student and you're trying to learn about sequencing some DNA or whatever, like, uh, or figuring out a way to modify DNA to do a particular thing. And like, you come into class, you do your work, you you you're a graduate student, so you do you work, at, you assist the professor, and you're you're also doing research on the side. But then on your free time all your homies are other like graduate students and they just talk about DNA all the time. Blah, blah, blah. And then one guy's reading this thing and another guy's reading this thing. And you just essentially, you have this group rat pack where it's like, not only are you doing something for yourself, you're actually 
passively picking up on other things and then like mm -hmm. uh, being your mindset is being pushed and your 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 prioritizations can change because of something new like you know essentially access to information and so uh in jujitsu one of the greatest hacks is like getting cool with people like this is why it's important to find a gym that culturally fits well with you because it'll make it easier because um, you want to talk to people you want to get to know them you want to and before you know it like how many times one of the great things about jujitsu is like damn i got in trouble like uh i got the speeding ticket it's like wait i know the sheriff of the fucking you know I mean? or like uh damn uh there's a big ass hole in my wall it's like you know what my boy we drill all the time he's a fucking contractor like what the there's that like sense of community you know similar to like let's say you go to church and the and then uh, mm -hmm. the, the choir part of the, the choir coordinator is she she's like she's an attorney and so you can talk to her first it's like having you know? friends right exactly but you know uh jujitsu is like a second home for many people so it makes sense that that home is full of family members that you really care about and like whatever and when you lean into your family you get a lot more back so yes gym rat pack huge uh find that like you know in every gym there's gonna be clicks so like uh you know the, the young guys that are just trying to kill each other boom you got a group or the older guys that look back and talk shit about the young guys killing each other boom you got a group or you got the black belts that like are talking about like conceptual jiu-jitsu oh boom you got a group you got you got so many uh uh there's so many people in jiu-jitsu so many different types you're gonna find someone you know and so it starts with the culture in my opinion because yeah, yeah. jiu-jitsu fraud and jiu-jitsu is so low because jiu-jitsu takes so long to become a like really proficient and have the confidence to even want to teach that like um it's not about it's not about quality it's about style you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so like oh i don't like the style of technique that they teach i'm not into that so i'm gonna maybe try something you know shit like that like i don't know but um yeah that's what it is man that's like that's like the most beautiful thing about it i think i was and is that it's just there's no there's so little room for bullshit yeah. In a in a in a room in a world where like everything is bullshit, like yeah. everybody's lying, everybody's pretending, <laughs> blah blah blah. Yeah. You know, whatever you can lie and talk, and then you train, and it's like you know what's what immediately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so like uh, that's what's great about jitsu. Like this, it goes back into that aliveness training where like uh, you can talk all your shit, you can tell me whatever, but when we spar, like we know what time it is. You know what I mean? Like you know exactly. where you're at, you know where you are, at. and right. it's not like hey, <laughs> yeah. Bro, you, bro, you said that in a way that like made me want to like give you tribute, right? Because you're no. like the dominant male. No, no, <laughs> like, no, no, I'm not. No, no, bro, the dismissive looked out that you know where you're at, dude. It's like I no, do, bro. Not you, but like, yeah, I'm just like, uh, just it's, but it's not like that. It's not like, hey, you're lower than me, so get the fuck off. Like, it's more like, uh, I'm in a position. So this is what's great about jitsu. When someone's not as good, quote unquote, you you don't think. And like a healthy environment should promote this. Uh, I don't want to train with him. Or it would be like, uh, oh, bro, like, dude, there's that thing you're doing. Like, it's not working out. And trust me, like, you should consider this, this, and that. It shouldn't be, hey, you're lower than me. Like, step back, bro. Like, that's not maybe in a basketball court. But like in, in jujitsu, the, the beauty of jujitsu is the ultimate goal is destroying that ego. So it's like, instead of you're lower, so I'm better, it's lower. I want you to, I want more training partners. So I, what can I do to raise you up? You know, mm -hmm. and it's the same when you're the lowest, your lowest level guy, you're just like, damn, there's just so much information out here. Like, this is dope. Mm -hmm. And same with the top, the top guys, like, damn, this, they're, man, you, you're missing that thing. And then you see them progress because you, they listen to that advice you gave them, like, yes, dude, fuck yeah. Like, hell yeah. Right, now right, now right. you're going to be tougher for me. So it can even co go down to a selfish thing and still helpful. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's what's great about, man, there's, uh, there's so much things about picking a gym that's so important that yeah um, yeah more people need to talk about it because it's not like if you have what i want like i've asked people like what's your criteria for picking a gym and then like immediately I go, okay there's this one's maybe not mm, you maybe should think more long term about this let's think about this like you know stuff like that so right um, right yeah yo you know what i heard on a um a documentary of the you heard of the oh man i forget their actual name the daisy fresh guys yeah, I've heard about them. I I know there's a flow grappling video on them. I just I had I haven't really I don't really yeah. know that no. I I heard of them because one of my buddies used to train with one of those guys who who moved out there, okay. um, and the guy was the guy was like doing an, an interview, and um, 
and he said something that was cool, which was like, we're actually friends. Like a lot of times you hear people at gym mm. talk about brotherhood and jujitsu, blah, blah, yes. blah. And then, and yes. then they go home and like, then someone asks them for help and they're like, sorry, dude, I'm at work. Yeah. Which, which made, which made me think like, am I that, am I that sort of beating, you know? Um, or just, just the value of like, you know, if you want to be part of a community and actually, if you want to be part of a community and have people who are friends of yours, like be a good friend to them, you know, actually yeah. like put your, make yourself part of that and, and show up, show up for the homies. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a tinge of cultish behavior when people say brotherhood and like, they don't really mean it. Like I know right, a lot of coaches right, exactly. that it's like loyalty is like, they say loyalty, 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 but it's really they're expecting loyalty to them and not the other way around. Right, right. So that's the right, whole right. thing I've seen so many fucking times. And I've talked to some people that got burned by that, but it's like, this is what I mean. It's like, find the gym that works better for you and don't be a like, and it's like, uh, it's like unconscious, it's unconscious. Spitism, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like yeah, you don't realize that, you're I being a that's what's tough about I it. I realize, like, bro. I realize. No, I know I not you, but just the figurative, the person I'm trying to help out. It's like, look, uh, this is why coaches are so important. But guess what? Like, if the coach is shit and you don't know that, like, you know, you don't know that right, they're being toxic right. or they're narcissistic or whatever, bro, you won't know. And right, they'll say right, the bubbly right. shit like, hey, we're here for each other. This is a brotherhood. Stick together, especially right, through this right. pandemic shit. It's just like, I hear so many people do that, but they're not willing to meet the students halfway and be like, yeah, but I'm going to be able to, uh, like, here, I'm going to give you this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you in this way. Like, is there anything I can do? Like, uh, you know, shit like that. So there's so Man, much that, cold that's something that's been yeah. really fire and trying and visiting different gyms and, and seeing different things. And I met a lot of people who were like, for sure, bro, try out other gyms, man. Like, like, nice to have you here. It's, you know, we, we hope, like, let me know if you want to come back. And yeah, um, that seems to me like the opposite of what you're talking about where someone's like talking yes. about it but not about it right like that's yeah. the solution of ego that's like big time you know what i mean big dick energy yeah for sure like know. when my coach was like yo don't ever go anywhere else like they're just gonna steal your yo, technique why yeah i know it's like why, it was like, why? It was like well they're gonna steal what's your good out there they're gonna steal your technique they're gonna steal the stuff that we have and it's just like what the fuck is this like and i knew it was bullshit but then i was like whatever uh and now i know like uh i'm more experienced and i realize like yo we have more options and choices than we realize more freedom than we realize and like know when someone's being a, like an asshole coach uh because th at the end of the day they're taking advantage of people who don't know better and so that like that's why i, I go the extra mile to be like bro when someone visits my gym, like dude there's this gym here there's this gym here dude check it out because at the end of the day i know it'll burn my ass if i'm trying to trick this guy to joining and then like I, I'm just thinking about extra students, but I'm not thinking about the culture to the rest of the squad. Right, right. If a guy checked out two other gyms, three other gyms, and they come back to me, then I know that culturally they're going to be a good fit. It's just like it's mm -hmm. the self-checking system. Whereas I'm like, don't don't bother going over there. You know, you don't want that one. That one's shitty. Like, uh, no, come or here. like the or like, hey, actually, if you sign up today, I'll give you twenty dollars off. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I can't fault people for doing the business like that, but it's like. Uh, I, th I guess well, it that's why like it's counterproductive, right? Uh, it's, in it's, the grand scheme of it, a, in the grand scheme of it, whereas yeah. like you, you're trying to, um, I don't know what I'm saying. But. I don't know. I think at, at a certain size, when schools are at a certain size, the culture thing sort of takes a backseat. And it's and it's just, mm. like, this is why some people, another thing was like, yo, there's so many people here. There's so many people here. Like maybe that that's proof in itself that this is a great, 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 school and like uh that you know can you can we both agree that that's not guaranteed <laughs> can we both agree so like yeah still check out other places please like i'm telling you like sometimes the smaller school and i'm not i'm it sounds like i'm being biased because i have i run a smaller school but it's just like if you go to some other school you get more attention from the coach you have you build better relationships sometimes like i don't know like you decide that but like me personally i love yeah. smaller schools like Bigger schools are awesome for uh, training partners, but there's also more seedy shit that can like hide. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, dude. Uh, my mm, main thing is interesting. We went over the common pitfalls, and so I just want to be like, yo, just know that's a thing. And whatever you decide, as long as you did your due diligence and tried other places before signing up, I can't follow you for anything. You know what I mean? Like, right, right, right. At least did the work. I like that. You know? Right, right. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna have to cut it off right, here. Man. You feel me? All right, dog. Um,
want to thank our sponsor today, Foxhound Fuel. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So they do a pre, during, and post-workout supplementation program. And it's it's really cool. Like they use real ingredients. I'm seeing turmeric, coconut, matcha on top of electrolytes and vitamins, BCAs, glutamine. Like these are when I think about glutamine and and, and BCAs, the electrolytes. I'm thinking about martial arts, you know. But George, who who runs this company, when I spoke to him, he I've discovered that he loves Ironmans, uh, loves the martial arts, UFC, you name it. And he wanted something that had real products, like real things that's going to actually help him recover, prepare, all that stuff. And it made sense for me too, for jujitsu, you know, it's it's a consistency thing. So it's a grind and we sweat a lot. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefit that we can have from using these products like this. So um, I thought it would be a good fit. They're going to give us a discount code here. So it's from the Dojo 15. You'll get a discount and help us out as well. Um, come check it out. It's pretty cool. Hope you guys like that episode. And, uh, you know, again, I just want to I just want to answer questions. You know, I think that's the best way to help someone is if they have a question, I would love to answer it. So if you guys ever want to reach out to me and it's a great question or whatever, like I would love to make it a topic and record myself just answering it. So um it's BAME Jiu Jitsu, B A E M Jiu Jitsu. And I'm on Instagram, uh, uh, YouTube. Hit me up on my website. It's all good. Just reach out to me and I would love to help however I can. Um, and if you're ever in the Fremont area, Fremont, California, come by. Come check me out. Come train with us. And, uh, you know, open, open door policy. I don't care where you're from. Let's go. Let's get it.